Hello, everybody. All right, let's see. We got 36 in here. Been playing with my lighting here. I'm in a whole different location than I've ever shot before. And it's not ideal, but I think it works. Um, as usual, comment below. Let me know you're here. Sound sounds good, all that stuff, where you're from. And hello. Good to see everybody. Um, we are back in our hometown of Grand Junction, Colorado. I'll explain that a little bit more when we get into it. We've been basically snowbirding all winter. And I'll tell you how we put videos out during that time. Um, and some of the things we've been doing. We're going to cover a number of different things. And then as usual, we will do a live um, Q&A chat. If you guys have any questions about anything, home improvement, drywall, what we've been doing, so on. But. I've got a number of things we're going to cover. Let me pull up this one screen. Now, if you see me looking all over, I'm because I'm back here, I'm working on a 49-inch ultra-wide monitor that I bought about a year and a half ago. For me, it makes it a lot easier for editing, but sometimes your neck is on a swivel. you got to look around a lot. So I've got the main screen here where I can see me talking to you guys. I've got a illustration screen. I got some images, got my website, and then I've got an outline here of what we're going to talk about. Um, yep, yeah, that's part of what I'm going to talk about now that we're back home. So I'll just give you guys a rundown on um what we've been doing for the past seven months because we haven't had a home we've sort of been homeless um not exactly but we sort of have <laughs> you'll get it when i tell you we had a a rental we've had to rent for about oh quite a while the last house i owned i sold it in 2004 it was a house with a 2100 square foot garage eight car garage finished skip child bonos painted had a half bath all this stuff i really liked it but my dad was having health issues so i sold it came here to grand junction to help him out he and i were going to buy 20 acres together and split it up and he passed away suddenly at 70 and my wife and i at that time we've had to move about 12 times because of that so I haven't owned a house since 2004 and that's one of my high priorities right here. I'll tell you about that too. Uh, basically we've been spending the winter in Quartzsite, Arizona in our RV. Um, this was Quartzsite. It was a gorgeous place to be and uh, like I say we were in our RV which is this baby right here so this is our home right now and I was putting videos out out in the desert this image you see here that was in the desert you can see I made a little porch out there a little walkway it's kind of what everybody does out there you can stay out in the desert and quartzite for seven months for hundred and eighty dollars flat fee so we were trying to save money ended up not getting to save as much as we wanted because we just had a bunch of unexpected um, expenses uh, just tell you real quickly what those were we while we were trying to get out of town and head that way and get into our new RV uh, my wife's car quit running the power steering went out we had to leave it behind that cost us four thousand dollars to fix um, her daughter dumped a mess on us our shop she had been running our shop here as an alterations business uh, but we still had the back half and she was about to get evicted was misleading us about paying it 
So we had to run down and spend $4,000 on that. And um, let's see. And then, um, then as you, a lot of you probably know, I got hit by the hackers. These hackers took down a lot of channels, so I don't feel so bad now. They took down a channel with 8 million subscribers. That is a computer tech channel. If they can take those guys down, they can take anybody down. And uh, real briefly, the way they do it is they get you to click on a fake sponsorship contract. That contract is actually malware. It steals your session code, which means... When you are like on Facebook, say, and you come back an hour later and you don't have to re-log in, that's because of your session code. Well, by stealing that and putting it on their computer, they become you. And they can do anything they want. And they went in and stole, um, changed everything about my channel. Some of you probably know this, but they changed every backup code. They put a security key on it, which I now have. I guess I don't have it sitting right here. Um, but they totally destroyed my channel for about a week. It took me to get it back. And afterwards, uh, my views went down about 50% for weeks. I lost thousands over that one. I worked hard to get it back. Uh, you might know that I haven't put out, um, many videos in the last couple weeks. And that's partly because we were traveling to get back home here. Now that we're here. Uh, I'm going to start working on our studio, our shop out here. I'll turn it into a studio so I can shoot more videos for you guys, including some live live stream training videos, which I'll tell you about here in a minute. But our main focus is we've got to really work hard to get back uh, on our finances. Uh, when we left here, I had a 740 credit score. When we got back, I had a 600 because of all the crap that's happened so i gotta work extra hard my wife right now is at a funeral for her sister in wyoming i couldn't go because we just can't afford it so i'm i stayed here to work on this kind of stuff and by the way um a lot of youtube channels tell you this i seldom do i'm going to tell you right now that we do as a youtube channel we rely on you guys, your support. As you see here, um, we make a you know a decent amount off YouTube, but without your support, it's not enough to do this full time and afford it. We we make enough to just squeak by, but that's that's all. And I really can't do much drywall anymore because my health is just too bad. I'm gonna tr try because I have to right now. I'm going to do like a job or two, a small one a week just to make some extra money. But both my shoulders are shot. I can't hardly sleep at night because my shoulders start aching so much. Um, I injured my thumb recently. Some of you may have done this. It's just all through here. It's really tender. Uh, my left knee is totally shot. I can't put any weight on it hardly at all without it being extremely painful. I can't bend it very much. So... You know, drywall is too demanding. It's hard to do much, but I can do some simple stuff. So YouTube is pretty much my living these days. And uh, it just really helps if you guys can do that. Or that one of the easiest ways that you can help is to uh, join as a member. Become a YouTube member right below every video it says join you just click that you can join for as little as two dollars a month that really can help us to uh, be able to afford to put out more because we're always building sets out here temporary setups so i can mock up a situation for you guys for taping for whatever and you know it just is a lot more expensive than you realize so we do appreciate your support. All the members that have joined, thank you very much. There's also a Patreon page. And uh, if you just go to my website, um, let me see here. Yeah, right here, I can show you that. If you go to my website, you can find a lot more information there. I've got some articles I've written, links to tool suggestions and materials. 
Um, also, other ways you can show your support. We've got a Patreon page, etc. Now, getting back to this, I usually cover my health each time. So I've talked a little bit about how everything's just kind of hurting lately. I take a lot of uh, a leave and came back from Mexico with one called Keteralaco. It's kind of a very high powered NSAID. It says to only take it for five days at a time. That stuff is is pretty powerful. It's not an opioid. You can't bring those back across the border. Uh, it's just an NSAID like a leave, but more powerful. And it does work, but you only should take it up to five days at a time. So I take that only as needed. I also do Kratom. I'm sure some of you have done that. It's just, it works pretty well for my restless legs. I still have really bad restless legs that'll wake me up at night. Uh, I still have long COVID. It's been almost three years and I'm still just, I just don't have any energy anymore. I fight it all the time, but I'm still working on it with healthy eating. I'm going to try some new supplements, etc. Uh, and my vertigo still gets me. Some of you probably know I got a virus in my right inner ear about uh, September 2018. It destroyed 40% of the nerves in there, which gives you permanent vertigo. Your brain has to retrain and learn to adapt, and it does. But uh, like when we were in Quartzite, we uh, took some, or I took some, um, line dancing lessons with the group out there. It was just fun. I'd never done it. I could only do it about 30 minutes and then it would just get me all dizzy and I just couldn't do it very long. That's how the permanent vertigo affects me. It, it can it can get me sometimes like that out of the blue. So we left Quartzite about uh, three weeks ago. We did some traveling. I have another YouTube channel I started that's kind of focused on our RV travel. It's this Route 66. You can find it under that kilted guy uh, behind the kilt. And we have about 1,500 subscribers there. We're just showing RV tips and tricks as well as travel stuff. Um, real quickly, we came back through and saw you know, Mexican hat and all kinds of scenery. We toured the uh, Glen Canyon Dam. There you can see the levels at Lake Powell. And Lake Powell is a really gorgeous place if you've never been there. It's very scenic. The water level's way low, but it's supposed to rise 50 to 90 feet this year. Um, we did the, the Grand Canyon... Let's see, this was Glen Canyon. We stopped at the famous spot where Forrest Gump quit and so on. But now, let's see, getting back to some of the classes we're going to do. Um, let me get back to that sheet. Okay, um, one of the things I'm proposing to do is some... Uh, live stream training classes out in my studio and I'd like to hear what you guys think about it if you're interested because it'll take a lot more work um, let's see oh, I'm, I'm going back to the comments here because I lost track here no the work I do is for the last 20 years, I specialized in nothing but drywall repairs. It's a little bit easier on me, and honestly, there's better money in it. The new stuff, you have to go 200 miles an hour plus all day long, and it's it's very, very competitive these days. Um, I found I could make a lot more money doing the repairs, but about all a helper can do is lug around some tools and that. It, there's just not much... They can do they get in my way more often than not I've, I've always found that almost every time i hire helpers i spend more time explaining how to do it right i can do it faster without them so um just can't do that yeah i'm gonna work on physical therapy i've been i went to courts i think i was gonna get more exercise and uh do more physical therapy type stuff but 
it's really hard to do in an RV and the wind blew like 70% of the time there. It was hard to even be outside. It was a tough year there. They said it was the windiest, coldest, so I couldn't do that. They hadn't seen that much wind and cold in a long time anyway. So, um, yeah, I'm thinking about doing these live stream training where I stand out in the shop and actually demonstrate something I could show different ways to coat butt joints recess joints taping um, I could even do a repair I could compare let's say the uh, California method to the method I most commonly use etc and it would be kind of an on-demand thing if I can do you know if I can do it right there with the setup that I've got like if you ask me a question in the comments of what um, size knife would I use for this or what tool would I use for this, I could show you that. I could do a tool demonstration showing what all the different tools are that I recommend, things like that. So if there's interest in that. Um, and that's what I'm talking on the classes. Now I'm, I'm talking. I'm actually this is a separate subject I am working on courses I'm gonna call these drywall courses where I create courses for a number of different ones these will be self-paced courses so you would sign up pay the fee and what you would do is you would get a uh, you would get a um, ebook that I write that outlines everything you need to know for that course and it starts at the very beginning with terminology and tools recommendations and so on and walk you through there's going to be a course for uh, novices for example so it'd walk you through every step all these different ones that um, my wife is texting me right now from Wyoming keeps dinging in my ear so I would break it down into sections like the beginning section where you just learn how to hold your knife, um, how to push the mud onto the wall, things like that. And each one would have kind of like some test questions at the end to see if you caught what you were supposed to get in that course. And then there would be an associated video that you would click on and go watch me demonstrate those techniques and then you would want to practice those techniques so it'll be like chapters that'll walk you through today you do this and next time you do this and so on and they're self-paced so if you want to blow through it you can go through it fairly quickly or you could do one uh, chapter a week for example so I'm going to try and make it really thorough and demonstrate everything about it whereas see one of the problems with doing youtube videos is is you guys tend to want a 10 to 15 minute video if we go much over that viewership drops off and so courses are better suited for that when i teach something i usually don't have much time to teach you about the materials the tools the techniques the why the how the pitfalls things to look out for so on in a course I would be able to teach you that and only one time see a lot of times we repeat things over and over in our videos I I often tell you you want to use a wide knife when you're floating a bigger thing and and you want to use uh, this much pressure and this much angle well in a course I would only teach you that one time on YouTube I have to tell you every single time because a lot of my viewers are brand new to my channel and haven't seen that before so you would get through the training faster in a way versus going and trying to find all these random videos that I put out all over you would learn it in the proper order you don't want to start learning how to swim by jumping in a swimming pool and floating or sinking to the bottom and then going okay let's see what did I read in that book no there's a proper way to do everything and you want to start at the beginning to learn how to do this the best way so that course would allow you to do that now I'm going to have multiple courses I plan on having a course for um, novice 
a course for intermediate skills, a course for advanced, and advanced would be, well, let's say intermediate would be like guys who occasionally do it. Let's say you're a, a carpenter and once in a while you just want to fix that drywall yourself or a painter, etc. Advanced would be guys that want to do drywall for a living. You want to be a drywaller. Then I would have an advanced taping tool course because the advanced course would teach you how to do a professional job quickly, how to bid it, so on, but it wouldn't teach you how to use the full set of taping tools because you can get by without them. You can use a banjo, you can hand tape and finish. So I'd have another course for the tool course if you want to use taping tool sets and that would just walk you through that. I'll also have a course about how to create and apply roughly 20 different types of texture. I can do most of them. I, I found very few in my life that I can't match and that comes from 20 years of repairs and 20 years of new construction. I'll also do a separate course on how to match those textures because that's actually a separate way of thinking versus applying the textures. Just how to knowing how to put it on doesn't tell you everything you need to know about matching it. Like just for example, to match a texture, I've learned to look at, try and look at how thick I think that texture is that tells me how thick the mud was how much pressure they put on it you'll look at the size of the pattern if it's a knockdown how flat did they flatten it out so on and if you don't get that right your texture may have the right pattern but the wrong thickness one second here guys So those classes will uh, give you a lot more training and that kind of stuff. I'll also, in the future, you know, all these are going to take time. I plan on putting out a class about business building. I can teach you guys how to, if you're in business, and it doesn't really matter if you're a plumber or, or drywaller, there's a lot of tips and tricks you can use to get more customers. It's more than just doing a good job. It, there's so much more. I, I will do a course on that. And then finally, I will also do a course on hanging drywall. So um, that kind of answers that. Yes, it, it's, it's going to be a lot of work to create these courses. And again, that's why your support really helps. Um, because it's like I say right now I'm going to have to go back out and do drywall work again and it's going to hurt and it's going to make me come in and not want to do anything on YouTube so the more support we get in the form of you know ev everything that all the different ways I talked about like this one here it helps us to be able to focus on YouTube full time and put these courses out they're going to be a lot of work. I'm going to have to mock up some rooms and I can't really go do a job and do it that way because unless they're really, really patient because it's going to take me a lot longer to do the job and I would need a quiet environment, no kids running around, dogs barking, etc. So the best way is in a studio, which I have out here. I just got to set it up and do it. And first, I have to write the ebook, of course. So, oh, one other way is you can check out our ebook store. We've got other things on that, that store. Let me see if I can show you some of them. Yeah, we even have the sanding disc. <laughs> um,. I took those off of there while we were in Quartzsite. I'm going to put them back on. Etsy has me locked out for some weird reason right now. They're, I changed everything to be extra secure after the hackers. And now I've got myself locked out somehow. But I'll put those back on there. But we also have multiple books. You can see them up in the corner of the screen here. The, uh, 
This one is about improving your the quality of your drywall work quickly. It gives you a lot of tips and tricks. I've got one on how to spray a knockdown texture, giving you tips and tricks on that. Like I say, I'm going to put the sanding disc on there. There's a bunch more on there. I'm just giving you a few examples. And in this one, I started four years ago, and then I got the vertigo, and then the long COVID, and I'm going to get back to that real soon and finish that one. So there'll be a lot in that store also. And as always, if you need any level five drywall tools, there's going to be a link in the description. You can get 10% off using my code. Oh, let's see. Yes, that's actually a plan. Um, doing drywall repairs is so different. The way I got into it is I was in Seattle, Washington, stationed in the Air National Guard there for a couple years. I hired on with a drywall company because in the Air Guard, you got to have a full-time job. And they put me in their patch and repair division after a while. And I thought I'd been doing drywall for about 15 years at that time, something like that. And I thought I was pretty good at it. I did a lot of finishing and quite a bit of hanging. When I went into the repair side, I realized it was a to totally different animal. It's similar, but to do it fast and match textures, keep a job clean, all that, there's a lot to it. And then how do you get the customers? And again, that's gonna be part of that business building course. Uh, I've learned tips and tricks on how to get a five-star rating on Google, for example, and have a website. People these days are digital. They're going to go on their phone, search for a drywaller. If you've got a website, you got a higher chance of getting a customer. And there's fairly simple ways to create a website. I created my own. If any of you have seen my website, I did all of that myself. And it requires no coding. It's through Wix. Wix has these drag and drop formats. It's fairly simple to do. So I will give you a lot of tips and tricks on that, how to get referrals, how to get um, um, advertising methods. I've tried what worked, what didn't. There's ways to get more business simply by following up with a customer. One of the tricks I used to do would, would be to follow up in a couple of weeks and just send them an email that said, hey, thanks for uh, letting us take care of the drywall repair issue you had. Hope everything's came out great if you have any questions about it let us know in the meantime if you know anybody else that needs any work be sure and refer send them this email or send them to our website and if you need anything further let us know something like that so follow-up can get you a lot more work uh, probably 60 percent 70 percent of my work was repeat customers or referrals from another customer so word of mouth is big. Um, uh oh, there we're maybe we're back. Um, textures are a, oh, it's really a um, preferential thing. What? what you like, what appeals to you. But what I would recommend against is a heavy texture like um, stomp brush. It kind of hangs down. Bathrooms, I think the best thing is a, a splatter or orange peel, basically, and full coverage. It's easier to clean. When you paint it, it resists moisture better, and it just works good in a bathroom. But sometimes there's nothing wrong with having multiple textures through your house. I plan on having multiple ones. We plan on building the house if things work out for us in the next year or two. And I want to show you guys all kinds of different faux finish techniques, texture techniques, and a bunch of uh, trick stuff like that. Let's see, I'm renovating a house that me and my wife purchase.
Yeah, there's there's a lot of waviness in most walls. Um, most of the time on production homes, they just don't worry about it. I did work on a house one time that was 28,000 square feet, sits on Lake Washington, and it was unbelievable. And they actually made us put a straight edge on every wall before we hung it, and we'd shim it or plane it. So it cut our production time down by about 70%, but they didn't care. They'd been four years just getting to the drywall stage. So it just depends on, you know, are you willing to pay for that extra work? Or if you're doing it yourself, which on my own home, I'm going to put that straight edge on and get it pretty straight. Yeah, and if you want to float it out pretty flat, my recommendation is hot mud and a big uh, skim coating blade. I wouldn't try and get it too perfect unless you got a reason for it. If you got critical lighting that's just going to magnify every waviness uh, in it. Like I have a picture somewhere that shows that. I'll see if I can find it real quick. But if you don't have that situation, it, it's really an awful lot of work to get it that straight. But you just figure out where the low spots are and you fill those in. That's what it kind of amounts to. With hot mud, you can go pretty dang thick. I wouldn't go over a half inch. That's really piling it on and not at one time. You want to put it on in a couple layers but I would really stick to a quarter inch or less. If it's more than that, you might want to think about doing something else like tearing the drywall off and planing and or shimming the walls. Yes, and as far as business building, integrity is huge. There's so many contractors that promise things like, I'll be there on Thursday at three o'clock to bid your job and they don't show up at all or they show up at 4.30. That'll that'll piss off a customer and they probably won't have you do the work they're already mad by the time you showed up they're going to go with somebody else uh, if you say you're going to start next thursday start next thursday if you're going to be late call them and or text them if you're going to be more than 15 or 20 minutes late i would always text them and let them know i'm running behind and rarely would I just not show. I would work my butt off the day before to get that other job done to make sure I got there on time. Yeah, that's the thing about repairs is every one of them is different. After you've done as many as I have, I've literally probably repaired 10,000 holes and 10,000 torn brown paper spots. You know, who knows? Some jobs, there's 50 of them on a job because they're remodeling. But everyone is a little bit different. That's why I don't say that my way is the only way. I'm just showing you one way. Like the California patch, for example. A lot of people love that. I've tried it. I've used it. It's not my favorite, but I do use it once in a while. Just depends on the scenario. So, yeah that's the thing about repairs is a repair class is going to be kind of tricky because there's so many different scenarios but i'll kind of teach how to look at it and try and guesstimate what it's going to take to do it sometimes the cleanup and setup can be half of it okay i have a hard time matching a thick large knockdown texture Have you seen my um, video on, let's see, I'm looking it up over here. I'm spraying a knockdown texture. I've got some really good tips on there. By the way, if you guys want to find any of my videos, this is how I find my own videos. I type in knockdown texture, oh, if I could spell that kilted guy rather than me trying to scroll through 300 and some videos and it pops right up um yeah i think it would be this one right here 
So I'll share this link with you. On that, I, sh I give you the sprain variables. Let me see if I can just share the screen. Um, yeah, we'll do... Oh. Eh, I'm not the best at this live streaming. Where'd it go? Video file, extra camera, slides. No, that's not what I want. There, this should do it. No. Nope. There, okay. Um... And we'll add it to the stream here and this video right here I walk you through and show you all the different variables you can kind of see there that it shows there, there's about a dozen different variables you can use when you're spraying knockdown texture from the tip size to the CFM, which is the amount of air coming out of your compressor, not the pressure. Uh, how far you pull the trigger, how thick the texture is, how far away from the wall you are, how long you let it set up. That video explains quite a bit of that. And I'll try and put that in the comments here. So if you go watch that video, that'll help you with that. So let's oh, remove that, get back to that. But basically to get a thick texture, you want pretty much the thickest mud your, your texture hopper will spray. Um, but that can take quite a bit of air and put on a bigger drop, so a bigger tip size. The more you pull your trigger, the more mud that comes out you'll get bigger drops that way. So for big, heavy texture, I pull the trigger all the way, larger tip size, thicker mud. And actually I said that backwards on air. You want less air because a lot of air breaks the mud up into finer drops. So you want the minimal amount of air that you can get to blow it onto the wall. If you use too little air, it'll come out and you'll have it all on your shoes. So you got to find that balance and play with it and then you can stack it. So by that I mean the more you spray, the drops stack on each other and you get a bigger pattern. It, the longer you wait to knock it down, the less it'll flatten out. It'll look smaller in diameter but thicker. That's why I say matching texture is an art. If you let it uh, set up longer, You'll get smaller uh, knockdown drop patterns, but thicker mud. If you knock it down sooner, it'll flatten out to be thinner and wider. So there's so many variables in a knockdown. It, it, that's why I put out that ebook. And again, if you go to my store and check out that one there, it's got a lot of tips and tricks in it that could help you too. Um. Yeah, the street rod is sitting right outside there in the shop. My dad and I have owned that for, he passed away in 2007. We had owned it for 30 years at that time and it was 95% done. We, we almost had it done. We were really working on it when he passed away on a, over an operation on a silly operation for a uh, fluffing up some nerves in his back basically and but he'd had so many heart attacks his heart was weak and it gave out on the operating table but I'll show you guys what he's talking about um, in case you want to see let's see share a screen stop that one share this one go to windows There. Oh, we've got to add it to the stream. That's our 1927 Model T street rod. 
I haven't had the money to work on it for quite a while because of all my illnesses and that. Um, but I sure plan on it soon. That was my dad driving it there. We finally got it to where it was looking like this. And that was my paint job, by the way. And I also built those fenders on the back and did a bunch more. Um, let's see. Yeah, the 32 inch will be a good one for floating that kind of stuff out. And then you might just have to keep putting straight edges on it. Like I've got a seven and a half foot level I use for that, or you could use a string, things like that. I thank you for that. I enjoy doing this. I enjoy teaching you guys, but you guys wouldn't believe how much work it can be sometimes. Like just setting up for this live stream, I started like three or four hours ago just setting up. It, it's a lot of work just to do a live stream for me. I don't have a studio set up all the time like Nick Nimmin or some of these guys that do this all the time. Oh, let's see what else we got. I'm, I always love hearing that. I, I've helped so many people do things they didn't think they could do. And that's why I try to teach in depth because that's the difference. If you just go watch somebody doing it and they're showing you how to do it, but they don't teach you the angle of the knife, the pressure of the mud, when, how, pitfalls, all that kind of stuff you're liable to have more problems. So I try to be the one that teaches more. Not that I'm the only one, but that's kind of how I decided to build this channel. Yeah, that car is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, just real quickly, it's got a Ford 9 inch in it. It's got a 440 Dodge 1968 440 high performance version from the factory. It's a special motor uh, automatic transmission. We put power windows in it. We had it all the way down to where basically it needs a wiring harness and upholstery and then button up some things and then I have to go get it street legal. But it just got stuck in storage out here in our shop for the last, I don't know, ever since 2007. It's with all the moving it's mostly just been sitting in, in storage. I started up once in a while, but I need to get it started up again, as a matter of fact. And hey, if you guys have any more questions, be sure and answer, or ask them down below. But let's see, that car out, since we were talking about it, I'll show you. This is what it used to look like when we got it. And... Then we took it in the shop and started doing a bunch of body work to it. You can see it's in primer there. And that's the fiberglass fenders on the back that I built. Uh, it was stripped down all the way to that. That's when I painted it. We had the motor out. That was a candy apple paint job. Came out gorgeous. Uh, we extended the back end down. You can see a lot of the Bondo over the fiberglass there. So anyway that's one of my projects i also have a 54 chevy truck that that's how it looked 40 years ago now that was in about 1980 i had a uh, really nice paint job put on it if you look closely down in the on the bumper there's a sticker that's my military pass because I was in the Air Force full time at that time. So that gives me an idea what date it was, which is roughly 1985. And that thing I still own, it's gone through its own bunch of iterations where I've tore it apart. The interior used to look like that. And then I took it to this. The vice grips are because that handle broke off. And now it's kind of sad. It sits out here with faded paint, waiting for me to fix that one too. 
All right, let's go back to the how many screws thing. It really depends on code. You want to find out what code is, but the most common code is three in the field and one every roughly 16 inches around the edge. Studs are usually on 16 inches, sometimes 24, but you have a top plate and a bottom plate. So if you've got two, let's say you got a wall like this and you got two sheets, well, you don't have a middle plate through the middle, so you can't put them anywhere except on the studs. But in the field, as we call it, that'd be between the top edge and the bottom edge. You put one every 12 inches that spaces them out to where you have three in the middle. So 12, 12, 12, 12. Um, some places, though, have hur or a hurricane and earthquake codes where you may have to put more. You may have to use nails. You may have to do all kinds of things. So I'm just giving you the most common. Uh, we worked in, like I said, Seattle, Washington. It's, Seattle's in one of the most high risk earthquake zones in the US and they had these shear walls where we had to double I think we had to put two layers of drywall in and nail it every six inches with like two and a half inch nails it would take like 30 minutes to nail off one sheet it was crazy so all right thanks streets that's that's the kind of support we need. Just that little bit. If a lot of you just take the time to click on that after this video or during the video, it really helps. Which book? <laughs> um, I'm going to show you guys something here if I can. Um, if I can spell again. Um, for those that don't know, I've actually written a book well before I started this YouTube channel. And um, that's not what I'm looking for there. So I've written a few books in my lifetime, like this one called uh, Do It Yourself Guide to Biodiesel. I got into biodiesel in 2006. I actually have a video out on YouTube in 2006. If I'd have known what YouTube was back then, I'd be rich. <laughs> but I just put it out to teach how to do a titration, which is part of the biodiesel. So now that I've got this channel and we're getting, you know, we have 260,000 subscribers. I have a number of books that I writing and I'm going to get most of these books on Amazon real soon. I get asked about that. Um, if you look up in that top right corner, you see the knockdown texture one here. I'll, I'll show you the bigger version. Let me get to those pictures here. There we are. Um... there yeah that that's one of my most recent one and that's the one i'm going to get on amazon first it'll be available as an ebook and a hardcover amazon has a service they call print on demand and um, i plan on doing that the way that works is literally if you purchase one of my books they print one book it's print on demand Bad thing is it cuts about 70% of my profit out, but I know a lot of you want the hard copy. So we're going to make that available for those of you that want that. Uh, I also, let me get a drink here. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, on that same store, I have one about how to hire a contractor tips on how to get the right contractor doing things like getting a contract you know it's got a lot of different things in there looking for their insurance refer references whether you should go with a high bidder or low bidder and all those kind of things and then like up in that corner there i've got one 
it's got a lot of tips on how to spray a knockdown texture. I think that one's pretty helpful. I give examples of different textures in there, uh, materials, how to mix it, the tools you need, etc. There's a bunch of good information in there, even troubleshooting. Like the pattern is too heavy, the pattern's too light, like someone was asking a minute ago. There's tips and tricks in there about how to change and fix that. Um, I also started one several years ago that I just couldn't get finished because I was sick. I was having all these problems with um, vertigo and that called drywall tools and materials, understanding the right, picking the right tools and materials for the job. I got it about a third of the way done and then I just honestly couldn't focus for the longest time after COVID. The brain fog was terrible so now I'm back a lot better so I'm working on that one real soon. That one will also be on Amazon in hardcover and ebook. The advantage to the ebook though, I know a lot of you aren't fond of it, but the advantage to the ebook is I can put links to my videos in there. So if I say, um, oh, let's just say if you want to see how I knock down a texture with this knife, click this link and it'll take you right to that part of the video. I can't do that in a hard copy, but I get it. I like hard copies too, but sometimes I buy both or just the digital one because they do have a lot of advantage. I can put clickable links in there to videos, tools, etc. Um, and I got more coming. There's more stuff in the store like some of our swag, our stickers. We got a number of different ones in there. I also have cheap things like tape measure tips and tricks. It's only a few dollars. It's kind of a way to show your support and pick up some, you know, download some of these things. So let me get back to the comments here. Yeah, oh, I was going to show you guys the worst video ever that I've seen. Let me see if I can find that. I, I kind of forgot. Um... Where did I put that? It was a video I watched on YouTube. Or not YouTube, but it was on Facebook. Um, hmm. I got to think where I saved it. But my point to showing you this is that, um, if I can find it, is that a lot of times you really got to take videos you watch with a grain of salt. Some of them look slick as heck, but this particular one was one of those, but it was actually showing you some really lousy ideas. Um, let's see, I thought this was it, but maybe it's not. So just be careful when you're watching videos that, that show you these clever tips and tricks because sometimes they're just nothing but garbage. Yeah, it looks like I didn't pull it off. So what they were doing was showing you things like, it was like 10 second snippets of videos and he would take packing tape and put over a crack and paint over with the roller and it looked beautiful. It's going to suck. Just in that example, when you paint over it with all that stipple, sure, it looks good, but paint is 40% water. It's going to shrink 40%. All of a sudden, that tape's just going to pop right through. And who knows how long it'll stick, and it'll probably bubble. If you see videos that show unusual ways to fix things, 
I would be really wary about trying it because they often don't show you the real true end result. And a lot of the YouTube drywall videos out there, some of them, not all of them, there's, there's a number that know what they're doing, like Vancouver Carpenter, a lot of you know of him. He knows what the heck he's doing. Uh, the drywall doctor, he knows what he's doing, so on. Um, it, if you take what they show you, you're pretty safe. But if they show you, what I'm trying to get at is lighting can fool you on a video. If you shine a light at me, and the walls behind me, I could do a lousy job on that wall and you can't hardly tell because the lighting is favorable. If you put that light off to the side, all of a sudden it's gonna show every defect I left. They never show you that. I'm gonna try and show you those kind of things because I'm gonna to prove to you that it's done right and there is a difference. And sometimes critical lighting, when you get that light too sharp, it's going to show everything no matter how good you are. So you got to take that into account too. But whenever you shine a light at a guy on a camera or a gal and the surface is behind them, it's going to hide any of those minor defects that might pop out like a sore thumb when the job is really done. So, and there, there is some people showing you some terrible ways to do things. I wish they wouldn't do that. I know... They're, they maybe think they're trying to help you, but if they're teaching you the wrong way, it's just... They shouldn't know. There's two, two things to nails and screws, and that's what I'm going to explain in that Drywall Tools and Materials book. Um, years ago, when I first started, we did everything with nails. We got to where we could nail fast. It was like tap, boom, tap, boom, because that's all we did. Well, then they switched to using screws because screws have a lot more holding power. I fixed very few screw pops in my life. I fixed hundreds of nail pops because they'll start backing out. Even ring shanks, they just don't hold as good. But screws are brittle. So I, I mentioned earlier that we had to do those shear walls with long two and a half inch nails. Well, that was because their thinking was a nail will bend. If that wall starts shearing like that, those nails will just start bending and bending and bending and hold on longer. A screw can only take so much and it'll snap. If you put a screw in a 2x4 and tap it with a hammer, you'll get a deflection of about that much before it snaps because they're hardened. They're not meant to bend. So nails have more holding power if it's a sheer surface and it needs to bend but a screw holds way better overall so that's why they went to that no my book was just a basic insight on the biodiesel book it was just a kind of a explanation of what biodiesel is how it's made on a real simple explanation i didn't get into explaining how to build processors and that i actually at that time manufactured biodiesel processors and sold them under the name of easy biodiesel and we had three distributors across the country and five people working in a warehouse the distributors had full truck wraps this was in 2008 when things were crazy fuel prices and we couldn't sell them. We couldn't get them out the door fast enough. Um, but anyway, the book is just kind of a general guideline on what biodiesel was and how it's made. You're welcome. And I actually had a free biodiesel course people could, could go through that took seven days to go through it. So I've written a lot of books and materials and training courses. So... Yeah, there's not, there's really not much training on drywall in the U.S. That's kind of why I want to put these courses out. A lot of times the way the training works is either like myself. I went to work for my dad when I was eight years old. Um, he used to change my diaper on a job. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't have done it at eight. But 
No, I was walking on drywall stilts when I was eight years old because my dad did this. So he took me on a job. I couldn't reach the nails that were six feet high off the floor. That's how little I was. So they, they put me on stilts. I probably spotted like, I don't know, like 10 nails a minute. I was terribly slow. But then as I got a little older, like 11 and 12, I think I hung my first drywall ceiling with my dad when I was like 13. It seemed really heavy holding up my end while he's holding up his end of a 12 foot sheet, which weighs a little over a hundred pounds. And then after, when I got in high school, I had a car as soon as I could drive and I would show up on a job site every day after work. So mine was on the job training. That's how I think a lot of people get it here in the US anyway. And then in big cities, often it's through um, unions. I've never been in a union, so I don't know much about it, but often they train them that way. But I feel like the training in this country especially is really weak. So that's kind of why I'm wanting to put um, these classes out. Because, yeah, it is more of an apprentice program than formal schooling. And it and I kind of get that. It's It's kind of hard to teach in a classroom. Even after you go through my courses, you're not going to be a master drywaller. I don't care if you take all of them. It takes practice, but you're going to be way ahead of the curve. Like when I started doing drywall repairs, it took me five or six years to get decent at it. And again, I'd already been doing drywall for about 15 years, but there were so many more tricks and tips. Sure, I could do it, but I was slow. I didn't match textures very good. I often didn't even know what to do to match a texture. Little trip tricks and tips like, do you prime? Do you not prime? Can you get away with this? Can you get away with that? It took me, I'd say, close to 10 years to get really good. And after 20, I realized I'm still learning, but not as much. But I still learn little tips and tricks that I just hadn't thought of years ago. So it's a continual learning and that's the way you're going to get good at it is you're going to like if I do a drywall repair course you're going to go from taking five or six years to get decent to taking one year or less six months maybe because I'm going to show you a lot of the mistakes I made and tell you how not to make them that's kind of how I learned a lot of what I know with drywall repairs is by screwing up and undoing it, fixing it, and making it right. There's too many times where I had to not charge a customer as much or spend way more time on their job than I should have or walked away with a not so great job. I think now my jobs are really, really good. Most people can't tell I've ever been there because I know how to blend the texture, match the texture, get the repair done flat and quick. I make customers happy because just as an example, I could, I've walked into jobs where I've had like three fist size holes in different rooms. I can get them all done from the time I walk in to the time I walk out in less than three hours. That's textured, masked off, vacuum, clean up my dust, all of that. And it varies with jobs, but you get to where um, you just get faster and faster and the quality goes up the more you do it. And hey. Okay, starting to get a dry throat. I'd say the age of the drywall is not really relevant. Uh, I, I put out a video a while back about how I think too many people skim coat too much because there's so many videos out there about skim coating. And it's a great technique. It has its uses, like a Paul Peck drywall. He's got a good channel out there and he does a lot of skim coating videos because it's popular. But I think sometime 
you guys are skim coating things that don't need skim coated. So when do I skim coat? Rarely. In a given year doing drywall repairs, I might skim coat two jobs. That's usually either a popcorn ceiling or one where somebody wants to make the texture go away. It might be four jobs, but it's not very many out of all the jobs I do because skim coating to me is primarily when you have a lot of things to fix in one area. Like just for example, I had a job where customers wanted to remove the popcorn ceiling. I went in and had them test it, scrape it, test scrape it, and it was painted and glued on like a rock. And I said, it's not gonna scrape well. I won't do it by scraping. I could do it by skim coating. While they were DIYers, they lived out of a van and worked on the house flipping it. And so they said, we'll scrape it. We got time. There's two or three of them. They scraped the whole ceiling with like three inch putty knives, scraping putty knives. And they got it. But there was torn brown paper every three to six inches. It just looked like a battlefield, mostly little spots, but where they gouged it. So I told them, put two coats of that RX-35 on it, that Pro 999. They put two coats on it. Then I skim coated the entire ceiling after I fixed any major defects. So generally what I do is you fix all the defects first and then skim coating can level it all out and fix all those little edges because normally you fix something and you feather the edge. But if you have too many, it's just going to look like a golf ball or something. It's hard to get them flat, but skim coating will flatten them out. So I use skim coating for when somebody wants a smooth finish or, and that's the final step, after you've fixed everything as smooth as you can, leveled out if you're doing new construction, or if there's just a lot of things that need um, repaired in a, in a small area. It's dense. The repairs are dense. Otherwise, it doesn't really help you. You're just kind of wasting time. There's occasionally another instance where skim coating comes into play, but it's pretty rare that I need to do it. I do, if I work on hospitals around here, they're usually smooth wall. I use it for that. Um, and again, I've had some people say, oh, I hate knockdown texture. Can you get rid of it? Skim coating will do it. Usually takes two coats, though. The first one kind of levels it out. The second one smooths all the final little defects because you don't want to put it on real thick. It's hard to put it on thick and you don't really want to. Um, so anyway, let's see how, I think we've been on here a while. What is it? Yep, a little over an hour. Any other questions? Let me see if I got anything else I was going to cover. Actually, there might be. Oh, one more type of training. I know a lot of you haven't stuck around for the whole thing, so you're gonna get bits and pieces of this. But if you come in, some of you are gonna come in and watch this after the live stream is over. You'll maybe get it all if you don't skip too much. Another thing I am thinking about doing, and I'd like your feedback, is on location training. So in other words, I come to you to train your company, or I put on a a uh, class a seminar like two or three days one to three days depending on what we're doing in your area so that would be like a major metro area say dallas phoenix you know chicago all those major metro areas where you can come to me in that area and take a class <clears throat> the problem with trying to do that i'm not even sure i can is this isn't like teaching an Amway class on how to build your downline and how to sell soap to your downline. We can't go rent a ballroom, set up a bunch of drywall, start hacking and sawing and sanding on it and not get kicked out and find a whole bunch of money. So I would have to find a warehouse that's empty, 
someone that would rent it to us for just that week and we'd have to bring in all this stuff to do it so the logistics of it might be more than I can do but one day I probably will have classes here in Grand Junction uh, Colorado or I may set it up in say Denver Colorado where I just go over there once a month and conduct the class but I rent a warehouse full time over there so some options like that I've had some businesses tell me they make all their new hires watch my videos first before they put them out in the field and that's why I think that maybe some businesses might want me to come put a class on in that area and it might be open to anybody in that area not just that business a lot of scenarios so and yeah Houston is actually one I want to I want to come to Partly because I have a YouTuber friend who is goes by Fleet's Wood Shop. He has the most immaculate 4,000 square foot wood shop you've ever seen. Go look him up if you're into woodworking. You will have your mind blown because he has every... He, if he builds a rack to hold something, he puts inlays in it or epoxy or something. Everything is just gorgeous and it's so neat and organized and he's a really cool funny guy very laid-back guy so I want to come meet him one day you know Doug if you happen to watch this hopefully I get to come meet you one day and maybe we set up a class in that area too and thank you all for being part of my channel and especially for those of you who take the time to become a YouTube member to do that it really helps us guys I'm telling you we really rely on your support all you got to do is click that join button right below the video you'll be a member and you get featured I see you as a it highlights you so I pay more attention to comments from my YouTube members and my patreon members because you guys are the ones that are help helping us do this and sometimes answering comments just gets to be a little bit too much and I all I do is hard it but if you're a member I'm gonna make a best effort to try and answer your comment first and as a priority um, let me just see if I can find this thing again here really wanted to show you guys this video it was really pretty hilarious honestly and I should have had to set up ahead of time, but with my wife going to Wyoming for her sister's funeral, that was today. She's been calling me and texting me, and I wanted her to. It just got a little overwhelming, and we've only been back in town like a week and a half, I think, after being out of town for seven months. So we're catching up on all kinds of things. Um go up here too but I'm still open to any other comments about drywall our personal life what we've been up to health issues anything like that and nope I guess I didn't get it saved right hmm uh, let's see what else did they do in there it was a lot hiding things with paint if you guys think you can hide edges on your repairs or dimples in a nail or anything like that with paint it's going to fool you because it's going to shrink back and it'll telegraph right through the best thing is to fix it right and don't try and hide anything with paint and this video made it look like you could hide Godzilla with paint. I mean, they were really fooling people and getting millions of views. So I hate to see that because you guys are being misled. Yeah, I did. I did a lot of work for water mitigation companies and fire and fire and water damage companies. And 
It's one reason my knee is so bad because with water mitigation, a lot of times that means we got to cut out one foot of drywall on the wall or somebody did it before us usually. And so I'd have to come in and patch one foot of drywall off the floor in the entire house or an entire basement. And that means crawling on your knees all day. You can't bend over that far. And it sucked in my left knee. <clears throat> it's got a big old knot on it. You can visibly see it from crawling too much. I tried knee pads and they didn't help enough and they often sucked. I found a good pair. I'm going to show you guys one day here, but most of them, um, most of the knee pads just they would slide off and fight me. And even with knee pads, I had blisters on my knees sometimes. And the other thing about fire and water restoration is often it's a lot of smoke damage or I had I worked for a company that fixed my house I once had a $70,000 water damage claim because I had a house with a 2100 square foot garage which was an eight car garage with four double doors the floors were painted it was skip trout bull nose painted half bath heated and I went out of town for three days and my house was all above the garage entirely and it the water line on the um, refrigerator burst and ran wide open quarter inch water line for two or three days and did seventy thousand dollars in damage so i got to fix my own house and i did a lot of improvements to it but wasn't fun so i've done a lot of that work too and yeah, if you can figure out how to do some of your own repairs, it's going to save you money. People do like quick fixes, like those patches with the metal screen in them and the mesh tape over them. I hate those. I plan on doing a video about that one day. Um, they can be okay for some things, but I've seen one where I was repairing this house and I saw this part of the wall that was curling up and I tapped on it and it was flimsy and I could tell what it was right off. So I peeled it off. It was about a 12 inch patch over about a 10 inch hole. There's no strength. It's weak. It's just a terrible way to do things, but they can work on small stuff. So um, there's a lot of, oh, a lot of products out there. And again, that's where my book about um, Oh, the drywall tools and materials, like in the upper right corner. That book is going to help explain to you what works and what doesn't, what tools are gimmicks, what products are gimmicks, and keep you from buying six different products. Us drywallers, we always talk about, oh, you need topping mud and taping mud and all-purpose green label and blue label and soft, and we you need lightweight plus three and hot mud and durabond and it's confusing if you're a novice you can get by usually with one to two products and i'm going to help narrow that down for you in these books same with tools i've seen a lot of you i've got a friend who's a contractor and a master plumber he showed he had me come out and help him one day he said i've got the tools you don't need to bring all yours he did but i hated them crappy tools feel like crap in your hand and if you're a novice you don't know that you just think gosh this is hard well it's a little bit easier if you have the right tools and the right materials and that's again what that book is going to help you with oh let's see and don't forget as always uh my website, I try and put some good information on there. Got a lot more to go on there. Um, you can find that at thatkiltedguy.com. My online store with ebooks and such is at thatkiltedguystore.com. So there's a lot of good information. I usually try and put all these links in the description right below the video. All right, unless anybody wants to just general chat. Let's see. Oh, got one more coming up here.
Yeah. Um, generally, the outlets should be out. They shouldn't be, or let's put this right. The electrical outlet should not be installed in the box unless you have to. Sometimes they do it so that you have electricity on the job. I've done those. Um, <clears throat> and you just have to work around it. But if you can avoid it, the best way is to um, just have the plastic box or yeah, it's pretty much all plastic anymore. Sometimes it's metal on a commercial job, but plastic box so that you don't have to deal with electric in there. You don't get mud on the outlet parts in there. Just a lot easier to work with. And I am going to show how to cut out boxes like that, both the measuring manual way and using the uh, drywall cutout tool. My dad and I were one of the first to use one of them in about 1980. We heard about people trying to do it with a router, so we went and bought a full-size router, not the little skinny ones, full-size one. Got an adapter for it that would hold a drill bit, just a regular eighth inch drill bit, not a drywall one. And we started learning. And at first we sucked. We cut wavy cuts around them and all that because there's a technique to it. And if any drywallers are on here, you know you got to go a certain direction. If you're on the outside of the box, you go counterclockwise. If you're on the inside of a window or a door, you go clockwise and the rotation of the bit will help pull it in, keep you from going all over the place. So we <clears throat> kind of learn trial by fire, but we got it, and then once we got it down, it was a lot faster. Problem with that technique and with cutting it out manually is sometimes you bury a box, and they can be a bear to try and find one. You don't wanna, you don't wanna do that. I've done it a few times. I have a trick for that too. I'll tell you right here, if you go onto a new job site or you're remodeling your own and your floors are bare, you go through with a can of upside down spray paint, marking paint, and you draw, like if there's an outlet on the ceiling, you draw a circle right below it, the size of it. If it's square, I draw a rectangle. I mean, if it's rectangle, I draw a rectangle. If it's on the wall, <clears throat> I would draw a line off the wall and put it about uh, three feet. I put a cross line about three feet out to indicate that if you stood that line up, there's a box right up there. So that would normally be about three feet up. If it was a double, I'd put two lines. So I had a, this little system where I'd go through and mark out the whole house, every electrical box. Then if we buried one by accident, we knew right where it was. So, a lot of little tips and tricks you learn. Um, I don't see any more comments coming through, and it's been an hour and a half, and I'm getting horse, or maybe I'm getting chicken. No, I think it's horse. I know, i got a dry sense of humor, but my wife loves it. I'm more goofy around her, though. You don't get to see that side of me. Yeah, hey, some green masking tape up here. I just noticed. Oh, yeah, my headphones were falling apart. A little green masking tape fixed it. <laughs> Something was splitting up there. But anyway, um, I thank everybody for stopping by. Thank you all for your support, all that good stuff. And remember hey if you want to increase your learning power a thousand percent be sure to subscribe to my channel and hit that thumbs up after you subscribe look for that bell click the bell and you'll get notified of all the videos and that's a wrap who's controlling the power oh that's me hey i'll see you guys later thanks so much I'm losing my voice. Thanks so much for stopping by. Be looking for those training live streams. And I'm going to try and put out two videos a week if I can. And if you're interested in RV life or want to see what we do in our fun time, 
Go check out my other channel, that kilted guy behind the kilt. Come on, camera, focus. Right there, anyway. <laughs> and I'll see you on one of these channels. Thanks a lot, everybody.